We've got two NBA games tonight. The season starts in 12 hours. It is time to run it back. Run it up to run it back. Yeah. Run it up to run it back. Run it back. Run it up. Run it back. Yeah. Run it up. That song back. feels yeah, me. Yeah. All right, this is it. Run it back day duh. We've got Sham Sharania. Sham Sharania. I'm going to screw it up every time. Stadium Insider. Uh, one of the hosts, along with Kevin Durant of the Etceteras, Eddie Gonzalez, and the man who just travels every single day and a newlywed and about to be on his honeymoon, Chandler Parsons. Good morning, gentlemen. How are y'all? I'm, I'm amazing. I don't know if I'm as good as Chandler, though. <laughs> well, I mean, okay, so where is Chandler? I feel like a, a daily theme is going to be, where are you today, Chandler? <laughs> I I'm back in my house now in LA, but I, I'm on a red eye tonight to St. Bart's for the honeymoon. I mean, what are we even like? Who are you and why are you even doing a job? If I'm you, I'm just traveling the world <laughs> at this point. Uh, so the NBA season starts today. This is such an exciting day for every fan, everybody who loves basketball, because everybody's at zero. We all start fresh. Chandler, do you remember your first game action? It doesn't have to be your first start, but your first game action, because I believe it was against my San Antonio Spurs, no? It was, it was. And when I was drafted in 2011, there was a lockout. So my rookie year was kind of all over the place. I had went and played in France for like two and a half months and there was issues with clearance of my contract. But yeah, I remember I was, it was against the Spurs and it was against that legendary Spurs team that I loved to watch, you know, growing up with Manu and Tony and Tim and uh, just nerve wracking. I feel like kids these days are built different than I was. I was nervous. I was, I was, I didn't think I was going to play much early on, which I didn't. Um, but yeah, I could never forget that going, going against Tim Duncan, your first game is pretty nuts. Yeah. That's a, that's a heck of an initiation, by the way, just so you know, you're plus minus that night, plus three. The Hall of Famer, Tim Duncan, a minus 28. That's right. Each, so take each, that. Yeah. Al did, right? Al did, I know, Timmy, right? Did, you, did you trash talk him? I feel like, I feel like you're a trash <laughs> you talk guy. I am a trash talk guy, but my first game as a second round pick, I highly doubt there was some trash talking going on. Maybe one. <laughs> I also maybe, feel... Well, Tim Duncan would hold that grudge for life too. So if you had talked smack, that's that's forever. Yeah, I don't I don't think I was ready at that point of, of, of my career to do that yet to, to the goat. I would smart. love Tim Duncan politely. I'd love Timmy <laughs> politely telling you, like, do not speak to me, rookie. Yeah. Like, get away. <laughs> <laughs> don't make eye contact. Don't look at me. <laughs> we're not on the same page yet. Um, but we do have games tonight, and it's two. I, I like that we're easing into the season with two games. Two big games, Celtic Sixers being the first one. Shams, do we have, I'm sure we do, updates? So the Celtics have a couple of players on their side that are going into the season as out. And Danilo Gallinari, torn ACL, he's going to likely miss the season. But Robert Williams, their starting center last year, integral part, all defensive center, He's he, he underwent surgery late September. He was listed out eight to 12 weeks. I'm told that Robert Williams underwent a PRP injection on Monday to continue to promote healing in that injured knee. And he's going to return at some point during the second half of the season. I'm told his hope is sometime in December or January, but hmm. it could even be later than that, guys. And so the Celtics are going to be very cautious. He, he, he tried to get back on the floor during the playoffs when that knee was just a few weeks off of meniscus surgery. So I think they're not going to make that same decision now. If it was the playoffs right now, he probably would play. But as of right now, Robert Williams is out indefinitely and hopefully coming back second half of the season. I mean, it's game one of that 82. If there was ever time to take it slow, this, this would be it, right, Eddie? Yeah, I mean, people were concerned in the playoffs when he came back as soon as he did with noticeable limp and end up having to miss games, missing times in those games. Chandler, you, you've been there. You've played through injury. Like, what is the pressure like to do that? It's, you know, it's obviously a little different in October, but you get to the playoffs and it's like, come on, you can tough it out. Yeah, I, I got to say the the knees, obviously, they can linger and it's something you have to manage, something I went through my entire career. But when I hear a PRP shot, that's not the most intense, extensive procedure. It's literally they take blood out of your arm, spin it, and, and you can play. Obviously, this kid's young. They, they sign him to a deal. He's part of their future. Like we just said, it's early. I don't think there's really a reason to rush him back. But when you get a PRP, it's funny. I see these these reports how the guy can't play for a couple weeks because PRP. 
I did it a bunch of times. The PRP is not what's holding him out, in my opinion. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, PRP. I mean, even I, a civilian, have had PRP and <laughs> right back to yoga the next day, guys. I'm not trying to call myself a hero. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to get that. I'm going to have to check that out. <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird procedure. It's just, it's just odd. But look, on the other side of things, you have Philadelphia. A lot of expectations for them as well. I mean, this is just a, a game of two giants that people are expecting a lot from. And Doc Rivers, seemingly every season we talk about is he on the hot seat? So I ask you guys, if the Sixers start off slowly, are we going to already be talking about that early in the season? Eddie's first. I think, yeah, I think, you know, look, this is a president of basketball operations that didn't hire this coach. That's always a little bit of a red flag. Mm. I know Mike D'Antoni's name lingers, but I, I think other guys like uh, Quinn Snyder and there's other names out there. Yeah, they can get in a place where, hey, they're lingering at 500. They're not feeling what they're doing, and they need a scapegoat, and maybe it's him. Maybe it's Elton Brand. Uh, I think Doc mm -hmm. is one of the better coaches in the league, but, yeah, they didn't hire him. They might want to hire their coach, whoever that is. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, ever since Doc got there, I, I don't think he's to blame for their shortcomings. I think they were the number one seed his first year, right? And then kind of the Ben Simmons thing cast a huge shadow you know, over that whole franchise, to be honest with you. But now they're they're fully loaded. They're healthy. They have, in my opinion, the best duo in the NBA. I think if any teams with this type of expectation starts off slow, they're immediately going to look to the coach. An NBA coaching job is like a big cesspool. They're going to they're going to think a coach just got fired by someone else. Going to come in here and do it differently. Um, I personally don't think Doc is the issue. I think, you know, James Harden is going to be really excited to watch this year with how motivated he is. I think the rise of Tyrese Maxey and a healthy Joel Embiid. I, I don't see Doc being the issue here if they, if they fail. Well, you know, when you, when the Sixers finished the season last year, I think there were questions about Doc Rivers. They end up keeping him. So this is for sure something to monitor, but overall doc Rivers is going to have his hands cut out because James Harden, Tyrese Maxey, Joel Embiid, getting those three guys to coexist. You're already seeing Tyrese Maxey on some nights is the one, a one B at times to Joel Embiid. How does that dynamic play out with James Harden right now? Everything is, is all good. And I think that James Harden does have the ability to play facilitator uh, and also play score at the same time, but seeing how the rise of Tyrese Maxey goes will be very fascinating to watch because he looks like a player ready to break out right now. Well, the rise of Tyrese Maxey, it, it is my next question because I read an article about James Harden talking. All he really wants to see more of from him is mean. He wants a little meanness because I guess he enters the room. Everybody laughs, smiles, has a great time. Is he is he about to make a giant leap? Is this the guy we're going to be watching for one of those stories? He has the opportunity for sure. I mean, he's an explosive scorer and from all three levels as well. He, he's a great shooter. He slashes, he gets to the rim. I've seen a player like Jordan Poole get the bag he just got yeah it's there right it's right there for Tyrese Maxey and there's gonna be nice he's gonna be the best player on the floor for them and that's on a team with Joel Embiid and James Harden but he's that good and it's his opportunity now to to show that yeah I, I think that the, the situation there is perfect for him he has two stars and the defense is mostly gonna be focused on those two guys and James and Joel are gonna run a lot of pick and roll and give Joel the ball a lot off the block and Tyrese is just gonna be that third guy that can go get a bucket and you know so I don't even think he turns 22 till this year. And, uh, you know, everything I hear about the kid, he's a basketball junkie. He's always in the gym. So, you know, I see, a, I see a huge, huge year and jump for him. On the Celtic side of things, Malcolm Brogdon finding himself in a really good situation, especially if these odds are to be believed as far as where the Celtics are going, his impact on this team is going to be what exactly Eddie. Uh, he's going to be a great shooter. He's a solid defender. He just needs to stay healthy. It, he's going to end up playing that Derek White role where he can facilitate a little bit. He can play off Marcus Smart. They love to switch in that defense. They love to rotate all over the place. And he can do all those things. But again, he's had a tough injury history the last couple of years. He's going to have to fight through that. And we'll see how it works. I mean, again, like we talked about with Rob, they're starting the year off with, with, with a ton of injuries and they're going to have to manage that. They did that all year last year, so they have yeah. some experience, um, but he's definitely got to watch out for in that in that uh, in that term. Chandler, I want to ask you a question about injuries. If you're a guy who starts to get the injury bug or you miss a lot of time due to injuries or or one injury, 
mentally, what does that start to do to you? Uh, it's tough, you know, it's tough. And it seems like they're, they're contagious. And it's like you said, it's a trickle effect. And the, the, the stigma when the guys get hurt, that they're soft as a guy that's been hurt. I hate that because I, I think a lot of them are unfortunate and just, you know, unlucky. Um, but listen, it's a long season. There's a lot of things that go into it there, you know, between all the practices, the training camps, the shoot around the games, it, it's a long grinding season that, and it's tough to stay healthy. And once you get one little injury, uh, you know, things can spiral out of control. So it's, I, unfortunately that's just part of the game and you know, that's what most players have to deal with, but man, it's, it's, it's tough and it takes a toll. And then when you start losing a step and lose your athleticism, it, it can really put you in a, in a bad spot. It's almost the weirdest perfect segue to our next story. It's Lakers Warriors. The Lakers will be standing there tonight as the Warriors receive their rings. I'm sure that's always motivating, but they also are dealing with some injuries. The last we heard was Russell Westbrook and his hammy Shams. Is he available tonight? And if so, in what capacity? Russell Westbrook is listed as probable tonight. There was as any, any time there's a hamstring injury, there is concern going into the year, but right now he's listed probable. What is up in the air is whether he, he starts or comes off the bench. If he plays tonight. So that's something that I'm going to keep my eye on. And, and, and so on the other side for, for the Lakers in the backcourt is Dennis Schroeder. He's going to miss at least the next three to four weeks. He underwent thumb surgery yesterday. And so they're already starting the year. Not off to a good start when you look at injuries with Russell Westbrook and Dennis Schroeder, uh, you know, on the mend right now. That is not how you want to get things started. Um, and they they have a brand new coach. And by all accounts, everyone is so positive. Nothing but great things to say about Darvin Ham. But he does enter a situation that seems to already be a little bit drama filled, probably more than a new guy wants to deal with. Do you guys have high expectations for him? And will he be able to avoid any sort of scapegoating if this season goes badly there's no avoiding scapegoating in los angeles and next to lebron james it's gonna fall on him it's gonna fall on russ it's gonna fall on all those guys that's just the nature of playing one for the lakers and two with lebron um i have high hopes for him i think he's a smart basketball mind he's obviously a good player in his own right but in that organization who knows how much autonomy he has who knows there's been so many cooks in that in that kitchen for some time now. Whether you believe the clutch mafia is helping run that team or not, <laughs> um, there's there's just a ton going on, and it looks chaotic, and it looked chaotic for Frank Vogel, and we'll see we'll see how Darvin Ham ha handles it. They talked a bunch about it this summer about his ability to do whatever he liked, um, but if Russ starts this game tonight, then who knows? Yeah, I uh, I agree. You know, I think. I expect them to listen to Darvin Ham early on, I think. But as a first-year coach, the minute shit goes sideways for this team, I think that it starts fracturing a little bit, and they're going to immediately point to him, just like they did with Vogel. And I can't see guys like Russ, once they start off poorly, if they start off poorly, not kind of taking it on the first, you know, your head coach with not a lot of experience. So I think it's a dicey dynamic. I still think they have a chance to have a really good season this year, but with that fan base and the expectations they have, uh, he's definitely going to be the fall guy. If things go sideways. Yeah. This is well, an organization that's fired a coach 10 year, 10 games into a season. It just fired fair. another coach two years after winning a title. Like you can't take anything off the table with the Lakers. But, and also with the season they had last year and the roster they put together this year, it's in my opinion, I think it's a little unfair to stay like championship or bust because I, I don't, I don't think that's fair, but you also need to monetize this years of LeBron James still being LeBron James. So it's a, it's a dicey situation in my opinion. Yeah. I feel like every year LeBron James plays, he's trying to play for championship. But I think what stands out to me with Darvin Ham is when the Lakers went through their interview process, out of all the coaches they interviewed, Darvin Ham was the one guy that they came away with. Like, he can handle a Russell Westbrook, LeBron James, Anthony Davis team. He can handle making those tough decisions to bring Russell Westbrook off the bench if need be. He can handle, you know, yelling or saying something to LeBron <laughs> or an Anthony Davis and really getting at them uh, out of all the coaches. So for me, and I think the Lakers uh, and, and people within that organization, it's continue to see that and see that take take form and take shape and see the ebbs and flows. Is that going to be handled positively by the players negatively? Um, and only time will tell as far as as the year goes on. And tonight's going to be the first test. But won't yeah, there be, 
Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just, I was just going to say, I wonder their internal expectations. Like yeah, they, they're going to say, yo, they want to win a championship, but internally, is it like, Hey, we think we're a six seed and we want to be out of the play in and we want to play at that level. Is that what they're expecting? Then yeah. Then, then they might have a longer, you know, leash and more leeway with that. But if it is, if they're held, holding themselves to yeah, championship or bus, yeah, things can get real dicey. That's, that's a pressure cooker that not everybody can handle. And Anthony that's a, Davis, great, that's a great point. Davis has to be Anthony Davis. You know, like when he's healthy, he's a top five player in the NBA and that's they're That's what they got the, him there for. So it's tough. You talk about rush, you talk about LeBron, but when Anthony Davis, if we're going to see him at that top elite level again, you know, it's got to be this year. It's got to be now. I we agree, say Tana, when he's healthy the, a lot by the Anthony yeah. Davis thing. That's, that's, that's big. The, the best version of the Lakers this year is Anthony Davis is one of the five best players in the league and healthy, but we have no clue if that happens. It's funny that you mentioned Shams that he was the one that walked away and they thought, okay, this is the guy to do it. Because I wonder what the difference is between, you know, having a great interview, saying all the right things, even during preseason, all of his interviews have been very positive, talking about all the guys, seemingly everyone's cool. But then you lose six, seven, eight, nine of 11 games. And then I wonder where this goes and how quickly, because we've seen LeBron turn, like we've seen him like someone and then we've seen him turn. And I don't know if they're delusional in-house or they're just saying all of these championship dreams so that the fans have something to hold on to. Is that, is that possible? Cause you don't I mean, want to lie, think, but I, I think anytime you have a rookie head coach, you, you kind of give a little bit of a leeway and then you see probably 20, 30, 40 games in what this could be. But Darvin Ham, first day after uh, after the, the the Lakers' first practice, it was Russell Westbrook's a starter. He finishes the preseason coming off the bench, gets hurt. We'll see what happens tonight. But I think just that tone, clearly they wanted him to try to see if he could start. Didn't really work out. Now he's coming up. He came off the bench. And so that was what Darvin Ham, you know, kind of instilled. And so, you know, that he's he's going to make sure that everyone buys into a role and and he's not afraid to make those decisions. We'll see how that plays out. Well, for his sake, I will cross my fingers. Uh, on the other side of things, we're not being disrespectful. That wasn't just us talking Lakers first. We're saving the better team for last. And it is, of course, the Warriors. Steve Kerr has already said, not planning on playing his top five, six guys more than about 30 minutes a night, at least to start. Smart move early in the season, Eddie? Yeah, for sure. This is, Much like the Celtics, they're going to have to manage their health all year long. They have some older guys on that team who have dealt with injuries throughout their career and they get a little fluky, even with clay. Like he's now had a full year to get healthy and to work out his legs. You still got to worry about that a little bit. You got some young legs there too. You got young fellas on the bench, uh, Moses Moody and uh, Jonathan Kamiga. It's like, let's, let's throw them in the fire. Let's see what it is. We just paid Jordan pool a bunch of money. Let's play him a bunch. Let's, let's play him a lot. Let's let Steph top off at 30 and then figure where that goes. But they're the Kings of like the third quarter blowout and everybody sits anyway. So that's Fair. according to plan, I guess. That's sort of their identity at this point. You guys, if we're looking ahead of this game, I need one thing from each of you that you're most excited to see tonight. Shams. Uh, well, I, I think every time Steph Curry gets on the floor, what you know, you're going to see is that look away three. He's going to, you know, shoot that ball and he's going to go sideways. Usually, you know, he's going going to go to the other side of the court. So usually it's going to be somewhere near half court. He's going to shoot some crazy shot and he's going to go the other way before the ball even hits the net. So that's my one thing that I'm, I think is for sure. Oh, okay. Chandler. Uh, Patrick Beverly will get a technical foul tonight. That will happen tonight. I think he's going to try and make his presence felt. They're probably going to get down early. He's going to want to be that leader, that dog, that trash talking guy. Look for him to get. Teed Wait up. a minute. Wait a minute. Are these the things because are these the things you want to see tonight? Or are these the things you're guaranteeing? Because if it's the things you're guaranteeing, then I need to introduce it. It is bank shot. And it is the one thing that will 100 thousand percent happen tonight i think each of us came up with something but these sound like your bank shots you're you're guaranteeing these things happening is that yeah, right he, uh, this would be my bank shot of the, of the night i had a couple but i, I narrowed it down to to pat <laughs> that's a good one Taylor must have spoke to pat last night or something <laughs> see if you can make this happen it wouldn't be that hard would it eddie do you have a bank shot for tonight you have to. I, I do. It's from the other game, but I'm absolutely positive the Boston Celtics crowd will be chanting curse words at the referees. Uh, Joel Embiid mm. led the league in free throws last year, and he didn't even play 60. He played 67 games. James Harden was fifth. We know his reputation. 
and he only played 65 games. Those guys averaged 20 free throws a game together. There's going to be some curse words out there. It's going to, it's going to get a little rough. I, the the thing so. about James and Joel is like, it always sounds fun. It sounds like it's going to be exciting to see. And then like twice a week, we watch them shoot 25 free throws. And like, this is awful. They're just swiping through. They're ducking under their pump. Like it, you hate it. Right. But what something. would we talk about if they didn't do that? It wouldn't be James for two years. I would get annoyed on the court watching this dude get back. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, it's like, well, don't. And I get it. Like, don't foul him. But as a guy on the yeah. couch, I'm like, don't call it like this play. Like, what are we doing? Yeah. Shams, you already gave us your bank shot. I already gave mine. I mean, Steph Curry all day. Yeah, you're you're going Steph Curry. I'm sticking with the the West Coast game um, just because I think, well, two things. I think I'd like to do the Charles Barkley over under on mentions on his new contract because well done, sir. It's got to be seven at least. And then for me, Draymond, I think all this talk about whether or not Draymond has learned anything over the past couple of weeks, I say no. And I think he is in a rough face, if not multiple times in the first half alone. I think it's happening. I think he's learned nothing. And it's going to be awesome. You're welcome, guys. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, if this doesn't happen, we should have like ramifications or some punishment or something. Right? We should have like a tally. Something. We should have like a whiteboard. I don't, I don't know. Michelle, you could put that in the back. I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I'd be say some Chandler space. could. I know. There's something we, sh- we have to do. Chandler definitely could. Uh, <laughs> Next yeah, Chandler, Chandler oh, wherever I- you are going to be, uh, just if you could carry a whiteboard with you on your travels. <laughs> Track the curse words from the Boston fans, unless we don't pick that up on national TV. Oh, we're gonna hear it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's definitely yeah. Uh, that was an easy <laughs> one. That was a layup. <laughs> I know. I was trying to think of other ones. I was like, oh, let me go outside of it. But it, it for me, it's Draymond because I've heard so many experts talk about oh, he's learned a lot in this lab, and I I don't buy it. I, I feel like can, as chi- like children, we don't learn anything because he wasn't you punished. Feel, <laughs> you can feel the tension of that crowd right now. It's already you can feel it in the air. So it's going to be fun to watch him for sure. It's going to be a good one. Uh, Coming up next, we are breaking down a lot. Shams. Shams will be dropping all of the knowledge, and it's the perfect day to do so because the NBA is here coming up on Run It Back. So I heard last weekend you guys had a team outing. Why was that important for you to spearhead that? It makes a big difference when you spend time with your coworkers and you spend time with your teammates and you spend time with those that are going to be along the journey. It is a long effing journey, man. No pressure, no fear. For what? No distractions. Let's eliminate all that stuff, put it in a baggage, then we can deal with that in the summertime when we're ready to have fun. But right now, the profession is the most important thing. Shams hanging out with Kyrie Irving there. Did he say anything that surprised you, Shams? Well, I, I think just his outlook on the Kevin Durant trade request and in his mind, it helping the team come together and move on from it and him understanding that a lot of this this upcoming season, they're going to be judged on. And so I, I look forward <laughs> for the conversation to come out. I think this is a big year for Kyrie Irving, big year for the Nets. Was the outing something fun or was it just a meal? Did he say? Because I want it to be paintball. For some reason. Well, to, to, to my knowledge, it was, it was it was at minimum a dinner. But I think this was something that Kyrie Irving honestly has been planning since August is try to get the team together. This isn't something that uh, Kyrie Irving's done in past years. He did it this this year going into the season. And so I think for for him, after opting into a, uh, to his contract, him entering the last year of his deal, showing leadership after missing most of last season was very important. And so this was an, another step toward that this this past year. Yeah, I, w- I would say it's important and a smart strategic financial move uh, moving forward. So, guys, are you, are you buying it? Are, are we going to get this version of Kyrie or are things going to change again? Eddie? I'm unabashedly biased. I love Kyrie. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know he's like one of the NBA villains, but I love him. Even having him around with him. And ex- look, I don't always agree with everything he says, but I love his conviction and I love how passionate he is. And he's passionate about the game. So I believe him, you know, from everything I've heard and then around the team. And I'm a little informed there. Um, everybody's into Kyrie. And, and I guess he killed it this summer. Everybody who talked about Kyrie at the gym this summer, it was like some Paul Bunyan tall tale, just <laughs> an absolute monster. So I want to see it uh, on the court, on the NBA court. But uh, yeah, I think we should have a great season from him this year. Chandler, yeah, and- you agree? 
Yeah, when when you personally know Kyrie, he's an awesome dude. He's funny. He hangs. He'll kick it with you. He'll. I know he's taking care of his teammates. He's a really good teammate. I just think you know, with him comes some distractions and everything that he's been talking about and believes in over the last years. Uh, it is distracting. And as someone of his caliber, it's going to be talked about. And now he's become this villain. But yeah, I'm with Eddie. He, he's had a great summer. He's, you know, one of the best three point guards in the NBA. And in, in he's he's hard to dislike when you know him. That's what exactly. I hear. It's Chandler. Did he really recruit you to the Cavaliers? And why didn't you go? If so. <laughs> Cleveland's not really my cup of tea, Eddie. <laughs> wow. <laughs> who's, who's breaking cup of breaking news? Tea, is it? <laughs> I, bit the bullet, I bit the bullet and went to Memphis. Cleveland was out of the question. That's well, you man. know what? At least you're being honest. And now you're going to get all the tweets from Clevelanders. Well done. Uh, we're going to the Western Conference because Shams, it's time for you to drop some knowledge on us, please. What do you got? So Jay Crowder, he's a guy that still remains without a resolution on his future. He spent some time away from the team throughout training camp, throughout preseason, and the Suns yesterday actually listed him inactive to start the season. I'm told they have still remained in discussions with teams that are interested in Jay Crowder. The, uh, the Atlanta Hawks are one team that has engaged uh, with the Suns, I'm told, in the last several weeks to try to get a deal done for Jay Crowder to bring him in with Trey Young, DeJounte Murray, and John Collins, but a no deal has happened. It's going to be interesting to see how the Suns and what the Suns necessarily want for a guy that that started for them, that they envision having a role on this team. They're they're one, one fifteen and thirty nine with him in the lineup in the last two years. This is a big piece that they're going to start the year without tomorrow night. Mm. Those are those are big numbers, Chandler. You played with the guy, and, and as a fan of the game, I I, I want to see him somewhere. What do you make of this story? Yeah, uh, you want Jay Crowder on your team. He's one of those intangible pieces where he can defend, he can knock down shots. He's an awesome dude, uh, and he brings that level of toughness, you know, to your team that not a lot of teams have. And with everything going on with the ownership, with the Suns, now I can see Jay literally not playing until Sarver is forced to sell the team, or there's a change in management or something. He's he's a principal dude. He's tough as nails, and he doesn't take shit from anybody. So I can definitely see that being a part of it. Um, I would love to see him in Atlanta. Honestly, he's one, those are one of those young teams that could use a vet in the locker room and on the floor, uh, like a Jay Crowder, but yeah, man, he, he, he's a great dude and, and, and he's a principal guy. So I, I can't see, I can't see him playing in Phoenix, uh, you know, this year until there's a change there. So he's not going to KD the trade request. That's, that's yeah. good enough. Here's the problem. He's not great, so I don't know how much juice he has on the on the trading block. You, you know what I mean? Valuable to your team, but yeah, I, I don't. I don't. I think he's a great fit on a lot of other teams, but I don't. I don't see him staying in Phoenix. But guys, l let's look at like the year that the Suns have had. Game Seriously. seven. You have the Aiton situation. You have the Robert Sarver situation. You have the Jay Crowder situation. They've. I don't know if tumultuous is the right word. I don't even know if this is a rocky you know, the last few months, I mean, they've, they've gone through it. And so I, it's tough, you know, looking at this team and seeing this being an upward trajectory. I'm, I'm definitely curious Chandler's thoughts. Like if you're a player on that team and you're dealing with one thing after another, the game seven loss, the eight in situation, the, the, him coming out saying, I haven't spoken to money with him. Then he says he has, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a lot, I'm sure for a locker room and a player and especially star players to deal with. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot. And it seemed like, hey, yeah, you can tell DeAndre Aiden, he's a disgruntled employee going to that gym every day. And that's just not good for the kid. It's not good for the morale. The dude saying he's not talking to the head coach. Like, clearly he wants smoke. He wants to be, he's pissed at it in the contract. Um, yeah, I, I think Chris Paul is a year older. Um, I think this is a team kind of like Dallas that's going to take a step back. I love their young players. So I love Cam. I love Mikhail Bridges. Um, but I just don't see them kind of being that force that they've been uh, this this year. It's crazy see, to I me because wondering... all of that drama is self-imposed. Like it's just, it's all in-house. It's all internal. It's things that a lot of it could have been avoided with choices that were done differently. The Starboard thing is obviously it's its own special entity that's, that's gross on a lot of levels. But Eddie, what were you going to say? I was just saying, I was wondering – just how much the Aiden thing is going to linger because he can be traded at some point in this year. And and he also mm -hmm. holds some control over that as well. And yo, when you get benched in a playoff game that you absolutely need to win and you're a starter on your team, 
And that's bad that for the whole world to see that's bad. And it lingered all summer. It's like, yeah, he got his money and and he got what he felt he was due, but that has to be something there. And then you, obviously you had the thing with Jay, same thing. And, you, and then Chris Paul, Chris Paul is just, he's a personality <laughs> to deal with. Um, there's a lot there that feels combustible. There's a lot of talent as well. We'll see. We'll see as the season goes on. Shams, could, could Aiden be dealt? Like, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I guess it could be, but could he, do you see it happening? It's just a tough price, right? Like they, they, they made efforts to try to get Kevin Durant when Kevin Durant asked for a trade and Phoenix was obviously a suitor that made sense for him and a, a desired spot for him. But any deal that w- had a construct of DeAndre Ayton, um, Mikhail Bridges, Cam Johnson, the Nets just were not interested in any of those parts in a deal for Kevin Durant from everything I was told. So that's what was, what made the deal difficult. And if this, and if you're the Suns, if you're trying to move a guy like DeAndre Ayton, you want a player like Kevin Durant. You want a Bradley Beal, like a top shelf star player. You're not just going to trade DeAndre Ayton to trade him. So that's the part that makes it difficult. That's the part. It, it's very hard to find value for that. So he, he's going to be trade eligible starting in mid January. If, if, things are not going well this year in Phoenix. If he's continuing possibly to show that this is not a good fit for him, then maybe you look at doing something. It's just right now hard to see a price that matches and makes sense. It's also Guys, I'm gonna ask, Oh, sorry. Uh, you're a restricted free agent. It's different when you have to go and get a contract from someone else and then have your team match it and then go back into that facility. No one, they could just the contract in the beginning. So I think that also has a lot of frustration with him where, listen, you could have just paid me. I'm one of the best young big centers in the in the league. Like, And they made him go out and get it. So I think that obviously has a lot to do with it as well. Because it's different. If they were just gave him that contract, I don't know how pissed off he'd be right now still. Uh, I'd be was petty no for offer. life. Petty. No, right. and no there was nothing. No, there was no offer. He had to shop and, and get one and then had that match. It wasn't like they sat at the table and just were close and not close enough. Mm-mm. There was nothing. And so I can't think of a real world scenario where it's like, yeah, my job doesn't want me, but they were forced <laughs> to take me back. So now we're going to just make it work. There's, there's nothing to compare to that. Petty and we'll see. And, and, and we'll see what comes up, com, comes, comes out of this, but Cam Johnson also was not extended. Um, right. And this is two years in a row where the Suns had a guy that's going to enter a restricted free agency. They, they could not reach agreement on a deal uh, based on their offers. And meanwhile, these guys are looking around the league and guys are signing extensions left and right. We are not done. We've got a lot more, including how the San Antonio Spurs could make the playoffs. There's a chance when we come back and run it back. Welcome back. This is Run It Back. We got Shams, Chandler, Eddie, and it's time to talk a little Western Conference right now as we begin the season today, fresh, everybody's equal. Warriors and Clippers are the two favorites to come out of the West. So I, we've talked a lot about the Warriors, but we haven't talked a lot about the Clippers, and there are some pretty high expectations. So what is, I mean, this is going to be a hard one, the one thing that you think the Clippers are missing, or maybe they've added that could put them in the running to really take out the Warriors? Chandler, what do you think? Uh, when you look at the Clippers, they're so talented. It's it's health of their two stars. It's it's Kawhi and Paul George being able to play um, and play deep into the playoffs. Uh, if John Wall can be anything that he was with the Wizards, that's a plus. Um, and when they're healthy, guys like Norman Powell, Reggie Jackson, this is one of the deeper teams in the league. I love Ty Lue as a coach. Um, you know, I think this is outside of the Warriors. I do. I agree. I think this is the team to beat. Um, and I think it's going to be a really, really fun season for you. I just hope we can see that healthy Kawhi and PG. When they're healthy, this team is this team is going to be at the top of the Western Conference. You you can see why this team is so tantalizing for a lot of people. They're built in a way to be variable in many ways. They can play big. They can play small. They can play a bunch of wings. They can play from the high post. They can play on the baseline. They can spread out with a bunch of shooters. They just have to stay healthy. And then on top of that, we have to see what their point guards are going to give them. Uh, Reggie's been great the last few years, but like, like you mentioned, we don't know what John Wall is and we'll find out. And there's, there's murmurs that he may start and he feels like he's ready to go, but we're talking about a guy who has not played a lot of basketball the last couple of years and they need him to be great because they want to contend and they want to win a title. Their window is small. Their guys are old. They've dealt with a bunch of leg issues and they, they're going to be on their backs all year. So, yeah, I mean, I think they're one of those teams, much like the Celtics, 
look, they're going to rest guys. They're not really going to be worried about seeding. Maybe get top four, but they're not going to push it. But as we get to April, they're going to lock in and they're going to be ready. And, you know, if they if they can handle the point guard situation and they figure out what to do with a Steph Curry, a, some of those slashers like that, uh, they're, they'll be in a good spot. Shams, I want to ask you, the decision makers, when adding a guy like John Wall, what are they expecting? What's the plan? John Wall, I mean, when you looked at him last year, he did not uh, he did not spend any time around the team. Uh, you know, when you, when I, I think the biggest thing was just how much in shape he was. And I think that they went out, saw him, got a grasp of, of what what type of work he's been doing. So w- with someone like John Wall, who hasn't played in the last year plus, is just seeing what shape you're in and are you able to come in and contribute? And so he showed during preseason that he can play. I'm not really worried about their guards, their wings. Um, I'm curious, their, their center depth, you know, Zubac at times had, has dealt with injuries. Um, how much depth do they have behind him at, at center? Do they end up st- playing small a lot of the time, but Kawhi PG, those two guys staying healthy, that's going to be the biggest thing. We know the torn ACL for, for Kawhi and Paul George uh, missed the playing game last year due to, due to COVID protocol. So there, it always seems to be something, but hopefully this team can put together a full healthy campaign because they should be a team that they can win a, cha- a championship. And I- I want to remind you guys for the whole season, I'm picking Kawhi Leonard as my MVP. And because when it happens, I want all of the props. So it, just it's not a bad pick at all. When he's right, no, nope. he looks like the best player in the world. Yeah, we yeah, remember that game in Dallas. Playing. Like, yeah. he's done that 20 different times. So I'd love to see it. Yeah, I have a love hate with Kawhi. He broke our hearts, but I've, I've forgiven him. And now I'm moving on back to being a fan. So it's totally fine. Uh, moving over to the Denver Nuggets. I, I, If you had to ask me who's the one player I hear talking heads argue about most, it's Nikola Jokic. It, it's either they're all in or they think he's just a little bit overhyped, which I think is ridiculous. But do we not respect the Denver Nuggets and specifically him as much as we're supposed to be? I want to hear what Chandler thinks first. as a player. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we can go to that. Let me go to that. I think the Nuggets, uh, the Nuggets are a fun dark horse team, and I think the with Jokic as, as a player too, he plays the game so beautifully. He passes the ball uh, so well, and he gets the respect from the analytics guys around the league. But definitely doesn't get looked at the way like a two-time MVP should, for whatever reason that is. It's almost looking at like Steve Nash's MVPs. Um, <laughs> it, it's just different. I, I don't understand why. Um, but I love their team. I think they look like the you know the team of the future before Jamal Murray got hurt. Um, and I think if they stay healthy, guys like Bones Highland and KCP, guys like that, they're going to fill those roles of the guys they lost. I think they have a very, very good chance to come out of the West, and, and that would be kind of my fun dark horse pick. But, yeah, yeah. Joker, Joker just doesn't get the love that he should as a two-time MVP. Uh I agree with everything Chandler said. I saw this team in the bubble. I saw how great Jamal Murray is when he's healthy. I saw Nikola Jokic and Michael Porter Jr. as he was ascending. To me, it's it's how does Michael Porter Jr. take the next step in his career? And does he stay healthy? Because Jamal Murray's back. Nikola Jokic is good. Um, so does MPJ take the next step in his career? They have Aaron Gordon, too. They they got Aaron Gordon. Once they got him, that was pre-Jamal Murray ACL. And I think, and I know in talking to people around that organization, at that point, Tim Connolly, who's now the president of Minnesota, he really felt like that team was ready and destined to try to win a championship that year. They just had made it to the conference finals. They were on the cusp. And then Jamal Murray has the ACL. Aaron Gordon's there now. He looks really good so far this pre, so far in preseason. So I think this team has all the makings. It's just about what does Michael Porter Jr., uh, what kind of step does he take this year to me? I think Michael Porter is a huge part of it, and a, a name Chandler mentioned as well, Bones Highland, a player, a lot of, you know, bag Twitter, they're excited about. They love watching this guy play. Uh, but th- the loss of Will Barton is huge for that team. They relied on him so much for a lot of secondary offense when Jokic had to go to the bench, a lot of their slash and kick stuff. Can Bones do that? Can he shoot well enough to make up that that loss? Uh, I think he can, but that's a lot of weight to put on a second-year guy. Uh, he's in a good spot to with Jamal back finally, and then Michael Porter uh, doing what he does on offense. He's just a pure bucket that he'll have a chance to ease into that, that role, but it'll matter in April. It'll matter in May, and it's going to make a huge difference for them. I think for me, th- the reason I asked Chandler and the reason, you know, as fans, we kind of rag on Jokic, I don't know that he can anchor a championship defense. I don't know you could win the West with a team that's going to have to play drop defense, going to not be able to switch on picks. 
Um, that always worries me, but I, he's one of those guys like players love him and then fans love to pick him apart. And he's like the constant guy, like, like Sean said, he's not really respected that much as a two-time MVP and his numbers are gaudy. His numbers are insane. It's like as, as, a, center, as a center, you picture a big athletic, like, you yeah. know, lob threat, shot blocking center and Jokic isn't that. So I think people just, you know, even though he plays the game, like I said, so beautifully, and he's basically another point guard out there. It's just <laughs> not you see at the five spot, you know, and, but I mean, it's, you got to respect it. The guy's unbelievable. Right. He's two timers. Like, come on, man. It's, it's probably time. Uh, Timberwolves, they, they made some moves. Um, they're going a little bit old school with the two big men and it's either going to work and be great or, or it's going to be a disaster. It seems to be the overall consensus. So do you think Kat and Gobert can coexist? Chandler, you first. Yeah, I feel like I should start here since I picked Cat as my dark horse MVP. <laughs> 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 they better coexist, but uh, no, I think I think you know Towns can shoot the. I think that's going to be huge for him to be able to really spread the floor and almost be a stretch four with his body, with his size. We, we all know what Rudy can do defensively, and then with those two guards, uh, I think they should have a good year. I think they should have a playoff. You know aspirations. And I think I know a championship is a little bit of a stretch, but yeah, I think those are two of the best bigs in the league. And obviously it's, it's going to take some time to get used to in chemistry and, you know, know the offense and playing with those guards. But yeah, I think with the, with cat's ability to stretch the floor and knock down shots, if he does that as a high clip, I think it's going to work great. Yeah. I think it's think? on cat. I, I think it's yeah. on cat as well. Like we know what Rudy is. There's not much changing what Rudy is. He's not going to be, uh, guarding guys on the perimeter too well. He can, he can do it in the right times. He's not going to be spreading the floor. He's going to occupy a block. He's going to occupy a baseline. So it's on Cat to adjust his game a little bit. If you remember, that 73-win Warriors team, the last team to beat them was the Wolves. They they handed them their, their last loss. And it was like this athletic defensive team that was flying all over the place. And Cat was at the, at the head of that snake. So if he can channel that, yeah. But he's such a quirky player. <laughs> he seems to want to play on the perimeter, even though he's seven feet tall and that's cool, but it's going to, a lot of it's going to depend on him. I think Anthony Edwards, he's ready to make another leap as well. So th they can be a, a, a strong, I wouldn't say contender, but they can be a strong playoff team and, and really give somebody a run. Okay. If you're seven feet tall, I, this is one of my things. Why would you want to play on the perimeter? Don't you just want to crush faces? and just do what seven feet gives you. I, I will never understand it. And you guys are going to hear me blast this all year long. And I'm sorry ahead of time. Chandler, don't smile. I, there's <laughs> nothing like it. There's nothing like a jumper in somebody's face. There's nothing well, like Pat that. Says he's the best shooter of all time. So, you know, he's, Come he's, on. he's, he's got to prove it on a daily basis. Man, I was seven feet tall. I'd own the world. Shams. Thank you. We will see you tomorrow, but the three of us are not done because I'm going to, I'm going to remind you there's a chance the Spurs can win it all. Kind of. We'll talk about it when we run it back next. <laughs> so Action Network put out a list of players who received the highest percentage. That's the very important word here of negative tweets. And there they are. Marcus Smart, Draymond Green, Bam Adebayo, Trey Young, and Jimmy Butler. Um, I think this was surprising. Again, it's percentage because they had other lists. But are you guys surprised by that list at all? <laughs> I demand a what? recount. <laughs> <laughs> right? What did Bam do? What? <laughs> like, what do we do? And some of the names that aren't on that list, that I, I don't know where this list came from, to be honest with you. I think it's a little janky, but right? some of them some of them make sense, but like Bam and like Ja Morant, like I don't see them being like villains are hated. Where yeah, where are Russ and, where's Russ and Kyrie? I will say this though. With Jimmy Butler, I get it. After he grew so, so the dreads on this summer. I I understand him being on the list. That makes sense. No doubt. And the Trey Young, I get it. There, there's the there for sure. Fans, and he's not very likable on the court. He's talking trash. But Bam, Bam is to me is perplexing. I I mean, again, it's percentages because they also had a list on the, the players with the highest number, total number, and and this made more sense because LeBron James is at the top of that. I could see that happening. John Moran, I really can't figure that out, but that's the list that also has your Kevin Durant, your Kyrie, your James Harden. So it's, 
you know, it's get Chris Paul. I could see him angering a bunch of fans. Um, Chandler, I, I don't know if you still read your ats or your DMs or your messages, um, but at its worst, what have you gotten? Uh, overpaid song. <laughs> oh, that was me. That was me tweeting that at you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, they're never really good. But when you're making, when you're on a big contract, especially, and you get hurt or you're not playing well, you're pretty much hearing it from every road fan and your home fan. So it's never, it's never good. Oh, no. Hey, I'll take overpaid. Over, overpaid works. I'll take that one. Overpaid, overpaid is, overpaid is thank better you. than a- Thank you. I feel like <laughs> yeah. you're winning no matter what. So there you go. Um, new segment because they're all new, this one called. So you're saying there's a chance, and uh, I'm going to name a team. No pressure, but you guys have to tell me if there's a chance, and it can be even a remote chance that they make the playoffs, okay? It's not that big a deal. Spurs, they're first. Who wants to take this one? And be careful. Come on, Chandler. Just because I took down the cat MVP thing. Listen, this they're not going to make the playoffs because simply they don't want to make the playoffs. <laughs> all their stuff. And by the way, there's this best draft prospect in the last decade sitting ready to be ready to be taken. So I just don't think they want to make the playoffs, which is why I don't think. How dare you. I love that pop got on the podium and said, we're not winning the title this year. Don't, don't start. <laughs> don't start with me. So yeah, I'm going to go. No, I'm going to go. No. And uh, I'm going to, I got them as my favorite for the number one pick. And it makes complete sense. This is the year to do it. They've done it before. They've done it masterfully before. Had a 20-year legend. Let's get another one. Let's make it happen again. Dang right. I know it. Um, (laughs) And by the way, that's just Pop being brutally honest. I think it's charming. Uh, The Jazz, that's a team that's completely unrecognizable from what it's been. So what kind of chance are we looking at there? But again, just to make the playoffs. Chandler. With the extra two spots this year? Does the play-in count? I I count it. I count it. But but Danny Ainge clearly doesn't want to. He clearly (laughs) wants to lose he wants to beat pop in this race uh but uh, yeah i guess there's a there's a chance um they make the play in and there's been a ton of injuries and everybody else is tanking yeah there's a there's a shot the only thing with with them they still don't want to make the playoffs either i think they're on the same wave as the spurs but there are a lot of teams that are tanking this year but no i don't think the jazz have any chance of making the playoffs dang okay so that's over uh kind of the Kings, Sacramento. What yes. kind of a chance? Is there a ch- Wait, yes? Yes, you're saying there's a chance here. They're different, okay? They're different because they have the talent. They have Sabonis. They have Fox. They add guys like Kevin Herter. They have, like, the longest streak in the history of sports of not making the playoffs. They got the new arena. They want to make the playoffs. They probably want the number one pick as well, but I think with <laughs> and their talent – I think they can sneak into that, you know, play in game bottom half better than some of these other teams in the Western Conference. Yeah, as a Sacramento native, as somebody who's one on the record and called this the worst organization in sports, I actually think they're going to make the playoffs this year. They're extra motivated. They, like Chandler said, they have talent on that team. Keegan Murray, he's the guy we picked to win rookie of the year. And with the Mariners finally going to the playoffs, you cannot be the last team to go in the playoffs in the oh. continental United States. So it's time. <laughs> Get the that's, nine seed, that's... win some playing games. Let's go Kings. Come on. Okay. 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 Last one. Last one. OKC. Who's been in this position for a minute now. <laughs> go on. No, they might Zero. lose 70 games. They, they're they not here Dang. to play NBA basketball this year. Can you oh, imagine with, with Chet and Victor next year, if they do get the number one pick though, the, no, <laughs> two- I, they, no. they have, and you know what? They aren't good at all, but they do have these young pieces. So no chance <laughs> at all, but I, I would love to see them get to number one pick. Cause then their future would be crazy. This is way too many a, teams vying for the number one pick. I don't like it. It's more likely we see SGA on another team than we see them win 15 games. So no, there's no Dang. way. Well, that's going to, that's going to do it for us guys. We'll be back tomorrow, though. Enjoy the games tonight, and there's a bunch more on Wednesday. See you then.